Hi folks, I'm Ling Fan Gao. I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft and I work on Fluent UI. And welcome to today's episode of Fluent UI Trainings and we're gonna focus a lot on accessibility. So accessibility is like a, a really, really big problem um, in web development, right? And the problem is that not many people know what the problems are. And even more than that, not many people know how to fix these problems correctly. We've already made this series called Fluent UI Insights. And in the latest episode, we talked about the accessibility challenges that we face in Fluent UI. I really recommend you to take a look at that video because we go really a lot into detail about all the different caveats you can hit with this accessibility in web development. But today, let's talk a bit about how the process about how we develop accessible components and what the common problems are. So the first thing to point out that like, there's a lot of resources available to you and probably the best one that there is and the one we follow all the time is from this website from the WAI, which is the Web Accessibility Initiative. And this website is called the APG. So it's the Authoring Practices Guide. A lot of these examples show you how to create different accessible wi widgets. So these widgets, for example, can be uh, menus, for example, is a really common one to, to try. They'll, there'll be a big write-up about what the behavior should be, how the DOM should look like, and what each key should do. But if you actually click on these links, you can actually go to a prototype implementation. So you can look at all these implementations, figure out how they work, or at least how the authoring practices guide folks recommend how it's done. In real life, we use these definitely as guidance. We like pay a lot of attention to how things are done. But... In web applications, like the scale you see in Microsoft, we use even more complicated widgets than these. And these will be more complicated widgets than you would see on any website. So we use these as guidance as a solid base, and we also build our own accessibility guidance on top of that. Another really good tool we use during development is this application called Accessibility Insights. You can download it for web and also for Windows. And for web developers using Fluent UI, we recommend you to, to download the Chrome extension for web. And this application helps you manage a lot of things uh, such as testing color contrast or running a fast accessibility check to make sure that the obvious problems are covered. And let's take a look at the two obvious problems that are generally covered uh, by Accessibility Insights and the two most common problems that we see in Microsoft developers as well. The first one is color contrast. So you can see this example that the text on both of these backgrounds is absolutely horrible. You can't make out anything and it's just a bad experience for website users or web application users in general. And you can this this is this is true because you can see that like the color contrast is very close to the background color and the foreground color. And there is an official guidance that we have, which is that the color contrast should be seven to one or three to one based on what text and how it's used. And in this case, we use tokens. So the good thing about Fluent UI is that our color tokens already suggest to you how they should be used so that you can get the best accessibility result for contrast. You can see here that in both of these examples, there is a color with a neutral foreground two and a neutral foreground three. So already the fact that we have neutral foreground two should probably make you think that there is something called color neutral background two. So let's, let's change that. And now you can see in color neutral background two, the contrast is now really readable. And this works for both themes. The first example is a light theme and the second example is a dark theme that we see here in two providers. And we've tried to make sure that when you mix and match the same type of foreground and background color tokens, we guarantee perfect color contrast requirements for every theme. This ties in back to what we saw earlier about styling. You should prefer to use tokens. We've put a lot of thought into our tokens. We've seen a lot of these problems beforehand. So we're really trying to make it as easy as possible for developers to not fall into these same traps over and over again. The second interesting thing to know with accessibility is that things have what's called an accessible, accessible label, accessible name. And in a lot of the cases, in simple examples like a button, when a user focuses on a button or a screen reader user rather focuses on a button, they'll actually read the content of the button. So when you focus on this button with a screen reader, you'll hear, oh, this is a button with an icon. But in other cases where you have a button with an icon, but no label, it'll actually just say button. And for someone who's blind, who's relying on screen readers to tell them what this element does, it's really useless. You can see that we have a good example here, which is a button with an icon. 
in an ARIA label. And the ARIA label just is that extra label that the screen readers know that when they see it, they should announce this. You should always try to use regular text content when possible. That's what the screen readers are optimized for. But you know, in modern web development, it's very common to see these icon buttons. And while these two buttons look exactly the same, they offer completely different 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 experiences for screen reader users. The screen reader user will focus on the button with no label and have no idea what it does. And on the left, it's a bit of a contrived example. They'll know it's a button with an icon. But let's say if we change this ARIA label to something like uh, pick a date, they'll know that when they click on this button, they should expect something to happen. Maybe a dialogue pop-up appears for you to pick a date from a date picker. So this is really important stuff. And a lot of the common accessibility problems can be solved simply by remembering that when you have no visible text to identify what an element is, just add an ARIA label. And now we're gonna to touch a bit about um, focus management. So in a lot of applications, right, let's, let's maybe go to Wikipedia. You can see that when you kind of wanna go through the page, you should press tab and you'll focus on these different elements as you, as you go through, right? This is fine for most web applications. There's no real problem with this. But when you get to a, an application like Teams or Outlook Online, you'll suddenly see that like there's so many controls and so many widgets on a page. Like here, you, there's only about like, you know, maybe 20, 30 widgets on a page. Suddenly, if you go into the Teams application, you'll see a whole load of menus, popovers, buttons, tooltips. There's a bunch of lists that are focusable. This is really hard for users to only rely on the tab key because you, they'll end up tabbing and to get to anywhere, you just need to keep tabbing and tabbing and tabbing. And one of the ways to try and manage this is to use alternative keyboard navigation. And the most common pattern that you use is using the arrow keys, for example. So in this case, if we look at like the Fluent UI menu, let's open it up here. You'll see that when I tab to the menu button, I press enter to open it. Now I can use my arrow keys to navigate in between each of the menu items. And then afterwards, when I'm done with this menu, I can just tab and I'll move away to the next thing. The same thing happens with uh, the toolbar component, for example. So when you have a lot of items in a toolbar, let's go to maybe a more useful example. You can see that I can use my arrow key to navigate between these toolbar items. But then when I'm done with whatever I was doing with this toolbar, let's say it was a toolbar to, you know, um, change editing options in a text area. Once I'm done with this, I don't want to move on. I can just tab and I'll move to the next control. So I'm not stuck with a lot of focusable items just by pressing tab, because otherwise I'll spend an eternity pressing tab and trying to get through them. Now, how do we, you know, figure out these patterns? For, for the most part, a lot of it can be just user studies, seeing how users would normally use the application. But as I said before, trust in the APG. If you really don't know what you're doing at all, and this is a new topic for you, really have a perusal at the APG website for the different widgets that they offer. Try to see what you're building. Is it, does it look like a combo box, for example? If it does, then, you know, you'll see how to implement that. They'll give you a full spec of what they believe that the recommended guidance should be. And then you can also try them out. You can try these sample Im implementations. You can just tab to this combo box. And then you can see here that I can use my arrow keys to navigate. And what's even better is a lot of the work, you can actually see how it's implemented as well. You can go to the bottom, you'll see in each of the examples, like in each of these elements, what the role should be, what attributes should be. They tell you why these attributes should be applied, but also you can even see the CSS file and the JavaScript file. So you can even look at the implementation and see how to implement something like keyboard navigation. Keyboard navigation isn't default in the web these days, even though it probably should be, but a lot of the times these are just JavaScript code that's managing focus. And if you've never done this before, and you really want to learn how to do this, don't try it yourself. Follow these guidances, take a look at them first, and then you can form your own opinions about how to do it. But start with this base. So thanks for tuning into this episode of Fluent UI Trainings, where we focus a lot on accessibility. As you can see, it's a really, really broad topic, and I recommend you to take a look at our previous video on Fluent UI Insights that goes into a lot more detail about the daily challenges that we face with accessible web development in Fluent UI. Thanks very much.